watching We Heart Therapy, the special series EFT Talk. I'm your host, Dr. Annabelle Bugatti, licensed marriage and family therapist and certified emotionally focused therapist and hopefully soon certified EFT supervisor. And I'm here in Las Vegas, Nevada. Today we have a very, very exciting guest. So we have Ryan Rana. He is one of our trainers from Arkansas. He's a licensed marriage and family therapist as well as an LPC. He's a founder of Arkansas EFT, and he's also one of the trainers who works on the Created for Connection series in EFT. So he's joining us today. We're really excited to have him on our show. And we are gonna be talking today about how to uh, attune to your client's attachment dilemmas and their pain. And this is important because sometimes clients come in and there's a lot of chaos going on and we don't really know how to make sense of it or just like how do we weed through all of that to figure out what's really going on here or you have the opposite problem where the clients come into therapy but they claim everything's good and that's really hard too so ryan thank you so much for being with us today it's great to be with you, and uh, I really appreciate what you're doing here. I think you're making a real difference in the EFT world, so I'm excited to join you. Thank you so much. So tell us a little bit more about how therapists might get caught sort of losing their way when there's a lot of chaos and they, they struggle to attune. Right. Well, I'm really passionate about seeing uh, therapists come to our trainings and and take on the incredibly awesome and awesome and difficult task of being a great EFT therapy. And so I've seen so many people attend a training and they're so excited when they leave and uh, they love the model as they should. And uh, cause Sue and the other trainers have done such a great job, but they go back to the office on Monday and reality hits pretty harshly. Uh, when you're gonna, if you're choosing to step into working with distressed relationships, you're stepping in the hardest kind of therapy there is. Also, I think the most important, most impactful. And yet, you can have a really, really great plan, and uh, and still the chaos of it can throw you off pretty quickly. Uh, Mike Tyson, who's a Las Vegas native, he used to say uh, when before a fight, they would say his opponent has a plan to beat him, and he would say. Uh, Everybody has a plan until they get hit in the mouth. <laughs> and uh, that's what can happen with us with those vicious cycles. So what we started to do in Arkansas was trying to find a way to deconstruct the complexity of these cycles as quickly as possible. When there's so much happening in the room, what are two or three kind of swing thoughts I can have that keeps me focused? As my mentor says, um, Keeping focus is the hardest part of therapy, and it really is. You can have all kinds of great ideas, but if you lose focus, we're in trouble. So uh, in Arkansas, and this is something that you and I have discussed off camera a little bit, uh, we started talking about trying to spend 80% of our time with couples um, on focusing on their dilemma and in their pain. And so... Um, watching our videos and really trying to become efficient with maintaining that focus. So you may talk about a tune, some uh, dilemma some more. Go ahead with that. Yeah. Yeah. I really, those are really good thoughts. I love how you say that, you know, we get really excited when we leave trainings and for me, they are very energizing. I feel like I've had that, uh, you know, that shock again, that, that jolts you back <laughs> into life. Like, okay, I can do this again. And then you get into the office. It's like, I got it. I got it. Oh, I don't got it. Right. <laughs> you know, and especially with those couples where they are highly escalated and they are just going at it and you feel like, oh my gosh, I don't want to play referee, but I have to find a way to figure out what's going on. They're both throwing so much at me and it's hard to weave through all the content, all of the anger which can be very dysregulating. I love how you said, you know, when therapists lose focus, yeah, because we can lose our feeling of groundedness, right, right, in session. And then we sort of lose sight of where are we going and what are we looking at. So I love how you said we want to deconstruct the complexity of the cycle right. as quickly as possible. And that is really, I think, the heart of stage one. And, and what I notice all the trainers do that's so effective is they do right. get to that 
part of the matter. The pain, being with them in their pain, which they feel like somebody gets me and attuning to that attachment dilemma, which you guys go for like every time. Right. And it's so powerful, but you know, we're not, we're not all trainer level, right? So it can be harder for us to, to be able to hone right into that and figure out how to see what we, what is right in front of us, right? Because a lot of times couples are throwing all these things at us and we don't really know how to understand what it is that they're putting in front of us in that attachment dilemma term. Right. So can you tell us a little bit more? So when you say attachment dilemma, can you, for the folks that maybe are wondering, what, what do we mean by that? Can you maybe offer a little bit of a, a definition of that? Sure. Well, I love what you just said. When, when we get knocked off our game, it can change what we see, right? And our clients in their, in their anxiety and the pain that they're in, which all of us would be this way, what they're often asking us for is come and get us out of this. Come offer us a solution or a technique or some kind of process where we, where we get out of this cycle. The problem is if you never fully get in it with them, it's really, really hard to get out of it. Because even if you have some really wonderful ideas or we know how marriage works or whatever it may be, they can't install these good solutions. And not only will we not help them, we'll in fact probably make them worse. So when it comes to the attachment dilemma, the phrase that we're using here, first I want to step back and give credit. So certainly credit to Sue as being kind of the source here. Other trainers, George Fowler, my mentor, and then Becca Jorgensen uh, is one who talks about this a good bit. By attachment dilemma, what I mean is, first of all, attachment is inherently a dilemma, right? Sue famously says, if you won't take risk, you won't get anything. And so attachment is about taking risk. More specifically, when you're working with someone who's stuck, it feels like you're working with two contradictory energy forces, so to speak, right? Attachment is that ingrained in our DNA to seek closeness for safety, but also our bodies have self-protective energy, which says don't take these risks. So these two things are contradictions, or they feel contradictory. They're actually coming back to the same source. So by attachment dilemma, I mean, what is someone stuck with that keeps them from being able to move? Do you ever feel like your client's not present with you? Do you ever feel like you can't quite get with them? And oftentimes they're stuck in a dilemma and this dilemma feels like they're holding a 500 pound weight and they're like balancing it up and like no one sees this. No one understands this like, situation that I'm in and they really can't move. The process can't advance until you catch their dilemma. I'll give you an example. This may make more sense. I personally am in therapy right now, sort of. Uh, one of my uh, children is a teenager and going through adjustment stuff. So I'm kind of a accessory to the process and so uh, so my so her therapist he's doing a great job he brings me in and in the, the context of you know cleaning up the room comes up okay and so he's trying to work with me to basically do more connection and don't don't get so caught off in the typical teenage path, which is a really great point and again he's a good therapist and doing a good job but I do notice myself going I have a dilemma here I have a dilemma and I'm not sure he quite catches. I'm not sure he sees that I want to connect and be a good dad, but I also need my house not to be completely destroyed. And I have other kids that we have to have some semblance of reason here. And I just found myself sort of sitting there going, I want to help. I want to do good. I'm not sure he quite catches these two forces that I'm stuck in. And I found myself saying, you know, if he would just reflect that he sees that, I would instantly drop my need to protect and just move forward wherever he wanted me to go. Yeah. I left an impression on me a couple of years ago when I was going through that, going, man, I need to make sure I do a good job. And so sometimes my effort to move towards solution keeps me from really being with people right. and, and how they're stuck in their attachment. And that's really important. And by the way, you know, thank you for, you know, sharing that little vulnerable piece that you're in therapy because we all need to be in therapy, guys. We need to continue to do our own work. And certainly by having one of our leaders 
you know, share their own story of, of being in therapy can inspire the rest of us to know that it's okay, right? I, a lot of folks have that mentality, oh, we're therapists, we shouldn't need a, our own therapist, but it's mm -hmm. quite the opposite, right? We get stuck mm -hmm. too. That's right. And, you know, I love what you're saying, how, you know, with the clients, they, they have this weight that they're carrying and they really want somebody to see it. And when we're misattuning, it does feel like we're not seeing it. And it sounds sort of great in theory. And I think all of us go in wanting to see each other's um, attachment needs and what's important to them. But sometimes it's so hard to even see that it, in practice, it's a lot more complicated than that, right? Because especially if they are really angry and you're really trying to get to that the heart of the matter right what is it where is it that they're stuck right to see the part of them that's longing for connection when they are really angry and they're launching grenades at, you know verbal grenades at their partner they're doing everything they can to push them away you know which again like you said i love i love 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 that piece about how you know we all know that attachment is wired into us but our body has those survival instincts that may send us a different direction just out of that um, survival energy, right? And sometimes that gets in the way. And that's part of what I teach my clients or what I teach my supervisees too, is we're kind of teasing out the discrepancy between what they see, where they get stuck and what's happening in the attachment dilemma, right? What's really going on underneath that does not get seen for right. that sends these opposite signals. and. Sure. So, you know, attachment dilemmas, what I hear you saying is sort of like the part where a client really wants to connect, they really want to be loved, appreciated, valued, feel important, feel respected by their partners, whatever, whatever it is for them specifically, but something is happening that, that's creating the space where not, they're not feeling that and they're struggling to convey this somehow but they're not really conveying it and they're so protected they're so angry they're so hurt they may be really on the defensive they may be yes. attacking or completely withdrawing going away and yes. so you're in this session and you're like okay i really want to be with you i want to hear your pain and they're like Where, what planet do you hail from <laughs> Yeah, and if, if, if you're dealing with something that's very, very chaotic, very, very stuck, if you feel blocked, there's a high chance your client is trying to say to you, you don't really have my dilemma. Like, I'm not sure you really catch how stuck I am here, right? And so I just think it's really, really important to do that. And the feedback I've gotten from people is when you reduce the process at first, to this, it really helps the clients, that, uh, the, the therapists stay focused. I'm not really a golfer, but I, I, I am an athlete or used to be at least. And they say when you're going to hit a golf ball, you can have one thought, maybe two. If you have a third thought, you're going to hit a bad shot. And I think sometimes when our sessions are really chaotic, it's kind of like that. And so I, I really want people. So, for instance, in step two in EFT, we talk about tracking the cycle. And we're going to go through, you know, the cue and the first appraisal, second appraisal, the meaning, the action tendency on one side, which cues the other side. And that is really an incredible thing and very, very helpful. The drawbacks are of that when there's a lot of chaos, that can overwhelm the therapist at times, trying to do too many things and don't get any of them done. Or we end up pulling out of the pain and making this too much of a cognitive process. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we can really attune with the client's attachment dilemma, oftentimes they'll, they can move forward. I think it's important to remember that you're not attuned to your client's dilemma until they catch it. Attunement is something caught by them. And I think sometimes our good, our good empathy is actually the enemy of great attunement. I can totally agree with that. <laughs> and let me, so I'm sure some of you guys might be watching this like, huh, how does that work? Yeah. Let me maybe sort of paint an example. 
So there was, I had like this really tough session and I was just feeling totally deflated and a little bit angry because I had such a long relationship with this client and I was just, you know, whatever happened, I was a little bit agitated by it. And so I was calling one of my EFT friends to sort of process and commiserate with and my EFT friend just went total EFT like, oh, Oh, that sounds so hard and I was like it was so outside of my window I know that she was trying to empathize right. with me but I was like right. I want to hear that you get where I'm at and yeah. when you're going way yeah. too soft That's right. that even just doesn't help me feel like you get me right, right? yeah that validation can feel patronizing yes if, yes if, if you don't get the sense that she has your dilemma yes Right, because you really, in that situation, you really, really care about your client. You want it to be effective, and yet the very things that you're doing don't seem to work, which puts you in quite a pickle there. And until someone really convinces your body that their body has your dilemma, then you're kind of stuck. You don't have a, have a great move. So I think that's what's it's really key. Which I think, you know, as you say that, what kind of comes up for me is that a lot of therapists struggle with the anger piece. And I know we, we always seem like we're in a rush to skip over reactive emotions to get to the primary emotions. And when we do that, we do sort of miss that attunement window. And clients are really, I've noticed that when they're angry, one of the most effective ways you can attune to them is to come to their anger and say, I bet you have a really good reason to be angry. Now, again, we're not validating angry behavior, but we're going to the dilemma, the pain that's that's really enca encapsulated in the anger and just saying, tell me about your anger, right? I bet there's a good reason for it. We're meeting them in frustration, you know? Yes, it may not be the level that eventually we wanna get them to, but you know, we sort of have to work our way down step by step to the deeper part, right? If you're climbing the stairs down to a basement and in the basement is their primary emotions, you got to start on the top steps first, which would be the reactive emotions. Right, right. Otherwise, you're going to be misattuned. If yeah. you're misattuned, you're, mis you're going to take someone who's already hurting and hurt them more. You know, and I don't mean that like blaming us as therapists, but it won't yeah. be. A, you know, yeah. you know and, and, and people can't, can't not have attachment needs. My mom's an English teacher, so don't tell her I just use a double negative. But, but, but in some ways, people want that. Because our attachment makes us vulnerable. Right. And, and but, so we can't get rid of that. So because we can't get rid of that, and it's not also working, our body's going to send up a limited number of strategies for how we're going to play this out. It's like I have these needs. It's not working. It seems to be making it worse. So my body sends me two or three options. These are moves that I might employ to either try to make connection happen and or try to make me safe. With attachment, we're always working with those two forces, the need to connect, the need to be safe. Go ahead. Which something is important in there because what, what my brain lights up with is, oh, but there's those clients that come in swearing they don't have those attachment needs, which I've learned, don't be fooled, that's right. part of their protective strategy. No, that's one of their moves. It's not need it, yeah. One of their so, moves. And that's, I think, one of the ways that we can struggle to attune to clients when we're, we're really trying to say, I get that you love this person, that you really want to be in a relationship with them. And they're like, I don't know. I don't know that I want to be in a relationship with them. I'm so hurt. I, I don't need to be close. Right. And you're like, oh, what do I do with that? <laughs> yeah. But I mean, notice how adaptive that is. If I can just find a way to not have needs, then I won't get hurt. I mean, it, it makes perfect sense. And so I think sometimes what happens, though, is that throws us off as therapists because we're trying to move them instead of really joining them where they are, right? Right, right. So, we sort of skip over the part of them that's pushing away, needing somebody as a protective strategy. And they won't, they are not gonna recognize it as an attachment strategy. And we right. don't need them to at first. We, the right. therapists know what's going on, but we right. can join with them rather than trying to skip over and push them into this place where I know you got needs, attachment says you have needs. Why don't you just agree that you have needs? <laughs> yeah, sometimes we want our clients to get better so much. We basically want to certify them in EFT, right? Yeah. <laughs> they don't need to know all, all of what we're, all of what we're, what we know. So, 
so yeah, it's like if, if you can see that, if you can see, hey, I don't have needs as part of their dilemma, as making perfect sense, you will relax. If you relax, you'll take the pressure down. You take the pressure down, you'll have a different kind of conversation. Yeah. It's so easy in that illustration. It's so easy for us to start pursuing the withdrawal. Mm -hmm. and, and next thing you know, the more we pursue, the more they withdraw, the more they close down. It's happened to all of us. Right, right. Or we try to pry the, the shield or the sword out of the hands of the pursuer. Yep. And then the more they're going to start using it against us, the therapist, because they're like, you're not getting me. And in an EFT, we talk about we don't we don't try to take their defenses away from them. We hand them to them. So it's like, I'm going to give you your shield and I'm going to help you feel safe so that eventually you are going to put your own shield down and realize you don't need it anymore. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. Yeah. We want to, we want to take the shield from the withdrawer and take the sword from the pursuer mm -hmm. without really appreciating how they got those and the good reasons they have to do those. And so what we're talking about with attack, attuning to dilemmas is a, just a, just a, a way to reduce and simplify the process of tracking the cycle. Mm -hmm. So with a withdrawal, with that shield, what would you say? I'll put you on the spot here. What's the, what's the typical two or three moves that create a dilemma for your typical withdrawal who presents? Um, well, what I hear my pursuers um, probably about 85% of the time, if not more, will say, you know, I try to show up, I, I do everything my partner asks, and it's just, they're always unhappy. They find some reason to be unhappy about it. They get critical, they get angry, they nitpick, they nag, and I, I just give up. I don't know what else to do, and if they're not going to be happy, then you know what, that's their own problem, and I'm just going to go away over here and make myself happy and tell them that they may need to make themselves happy because obviously I can't do it. Yeah. So that's a classic, a classic move that a withdrawer might do, right? Which makes perfect sense. This will be an example of attuning with a dilemma because how many times have you tried? How many times have you tried to talk more, to give them what they need, to make them happy? And every time you try, what seems to happen? Oh yeah. It doesn't work. It's worse. Not only does it not work, it actually makes you further apart. So you've learned for very good reasons that to stop, to take some words back, to take this down, to do some damage control. That's how it, that's how you keep your relationship from getting worse. That makes sense to me. And yet when you go away, you go away and you kind of make yourself calm down. That makes good sense too, except for that. What happens then? Then, she, then, gets, I, then she gets more upset with you. Yeah. So or I hear this other response, okay, yeah, I get that, I get that, but now what do I do to fix it? Right, right, so there's the pressure here. The anxiety comes up for the solution, right? So I think that's a great thing we talked about that last week in supervision, of having some phrases ready. Because if you really do a good job with clicking with the lemma, a lot of times the, the pressure will come down, but then a little bit of anxiety will hit to say, okay, what's the answer to that, right? Because we're the answer fairies as therapists, yeah. right? So, you know, I usually say something like, look, if there was a super easy solution, you're a really smart person, you already found it. Here's what we know for sure. Until we can create safety, we won't, we won't get anywhere. So for me, what I'm curious about is what happens with these two or three moves for you. So I'll just go back to the process. Because if, if you offer someone a strategy before you finish their dilemma work, right? it's not going to be effective. In fact, it will, it will hurt them a bit because then they feel bad that they can't use it. Right. And I have a withdrawer just like that, who is so, you know, they're, they're, they're with a traumatized pursuer. And so, and it's attachment trauma, not like I got mugged or was in a horrific accident kind of trauma, but it's major attachment trauma. And so, you know, they're constantly, well, so you're telling me that the answer is if I reassure them, just, just tell me the answer, tell me the answer. How do I fix it? How do I fix it? And I had to keep reassuring. If there was a short, easy answer, you would have done it already. You wouldn't need to come to me. And, right. and maybe that feels really frustrating because I hear how badly you want this yeah. to work for yeah. you to be able to calm and comfort your partner and not have this anxious uh, behavior coming your way all the time, right? Yeah, it feels like a cop out when we say it as therapists, but it does. but but it, it it's just true. It's not that simple. 
So for your withdrawals, you kind of asked me to talk about that, right? I mean, I think about kind of what you're saying, three or four moves. You know, withdrawers, a typical withdrawer, has le- his, or her, his or her whole life has learned, I'm worthy of love and connection only when I perform well, right? I'm only, and, and I, won't, I won't even share what I'm thinking until I have it formulated just right to where I know for sure I won't get rejected again right, with that deep sense of fear of failure. That's your typical classic with person that would draw a position. And so, so from that place, I got three or four moves, right? I'm told all the time I should talk more, which is violating my, the very way I protect myself. In fact, coming here is violating the very way I protect myself. Don't forget to share that with them. It's important to say, hey, I know you even being here goes against everything you've learned right that's starting to catch that dilemma right off the top and and that that three or four times you did try to talk more it made everything worse right so that teaches you don't try that and then so you go away to calm things down and then you get told that you're not invested enough that sucks or sometimes you get pushed so much here comes the anger right but then you get told you have anger issues Right? And this puts you in a really tough place. Am I getting that right? So spending about 10 times more than you think you should on unpacking and reflecting and validating not only that you see these moves, trying to achieve attachment ends, but also that they suck. This is a hard place to be. If, you're, if your clients think that the therapist thinks they should be trying harder, you will not change them. You yeah. will not move them. Right. And that what I love what you're saying right now, because what I'm what I'm playing in my mind is this withdrawal that I have that, you know, no matter how much time, every time I unpack it and I do, a, you know, a circle around the airport, as Sue calls it um, he, right at the end of every tale, he says, OK, but how do I fix it? OK, but how do I fix it? And it's like, <laughs> no matter how many times I try to explain it. So, you know, what I'm what I'm kind of hearing is, and there have been exceptions where the withdrawer has responded more emotionally to their partner and it felt so soothing to the partner. But I think for the withdrawers, if that soothing doesn't last, right? So they may do the right thing, you know, or the, um, the ARE once or twice and it has such an impact, but because it's not a, I think they're looking for a one and done kind of thing. Okay, I, I responded correctly. Now you should be healed and you should never have insecurities again. And for them, I think that's where that anxiety comes up is that, so I have to keep doing this. And well, obviously it doesn't feel effective if I have to keep doing this. That's, that's good. That's important. It doesn't feel effective if I have to keep doing that. Yeah, exactly. And and not only can it be anxiety producing for them, it can be for us as well. Because they're not trusting the process, which can feel like they're kind of insulting us. But the, the reality is when they say, how do I fix this? They're actually showing you their dilemma. Yes. They're saying, if I, don't, if I don't get this right, I'm not worthy of love. Yeah. Right? So that's when you get the, a lot of I don't know messages and a lot of distancing messages. What they're saying oftentimes is, until I get this really, really right, I'm best to just keep it inside of me. Does right. that make sense? And I think what I'm also sort of picking up, too, as we're talking about this, is that withdrawers might sort of internalize their their partner not being soothed as a failing on their part like somehow it's me and it's my fault my my soothing my strategy isn't effective because it's not long lasting versus really seeing their partner's pain that their need for constant reassurance isn't about their failure of you know and that their strategy isn't effective it's that their partner's just in so much pain right right Right. Makes sense. And, and, you know, when we're thinking about withdrawers, I use a metaphor. Is it okay if I throw it to you? Of course. Okay. It's unfortunately a true story. Uh, I don't know um, how many of the listeners have kids, but you know, when you, when you have a, a child, the first time they let you take the baby home, it feels like it's illegal because you have no idea what you're doing. Right. So we, we took our first child home. This is years ago. And uh, we didn't know what we were doing. The, our baby was like four months old. And uh, so four months old, they sleep like 18 hours a day. So we decided to take our, our five month old or whatever she was to a late movie to see star Wars. <laughs> it wasn't the smartest move. 
it was like an 11:30 p.m. start, and so we put her in the, the baby carrier. And Star Wars is there. We thought she would sleep. Of course, she didn't sleep. She's like overstimulated, these huge eyes. So we get home at like 1 a.m. We're exhausted. We just want to go to sleep. We assume she'll go right to sleep. She would not go to sleep. Never forget this memory. And so the more we tried to get her to go to sleep, the less she would. Right? And that's really, that's really your typical withdrawer who's in a cycle. The more the therapist and the pursuer, but especially the therapist, the more you need them to bring forth their emotion, the less they can. So to, so to get our baby to go to sleep, we had to calm down. We had to sit back, sing a song, relax. And then she's kind of reading us because the baby wants to go to sleep. And the withdrawer wants to come out and love well. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in this relationship, much less come to therapy, which violates their very survival system at all. And so as, so can I be with a withdrawer without needing them to come forward? That becomes the research question for us. That's a great, great thought. And then my, my mind switches to the, poor, the pursuer who's out here. And we do run into a lot of the same dilemmas with the pursuer when they're just swinging their, their battle axe all around and they don't care who's bloody. They're, they're just, ah, it's so angry. Why can't anyone hear me? And, and yeah. you know, we know theoretically that their protest is about how much their partner is important to them and, and that they're really not feeling loved and supported. But it's like you try to go for that and they are so distant from that feeling because they're so hurt and they're so used to the withdrawal not showing up for them or not recognizing their withdrawing partner is showing up for them that they have just I, I often use this analogy in my work about how you know it feels like there's this wall that gets built between them and the pursuers will often you know if they can't find a window they'll poke the bricks in the wall see if something moves that they can get a peek into the other side They'll try to find a door, and if that doesn't work, they will take out their axe and they'll start swinging to take the to take the wall down, and that can feel very hurtful. And sometimes we, the therapists, can get caught in that crosshair where it feels like that that cannon or they're swinging their axe at us, right. and that can be really dysregulating. Right. And it's hard to attune to their dilemma when they're so angry and spewing just all these angry, hurtful things. I hate my partner. I don't really know if I want to be here, which again, zooming out, we see as a protest, but can you tell us a little bit how to go to that? Yeah, I think um, as we were saying earlier, you know, kind of just a, an informal supervision point, not like a, not trying to change the EFT model, nothing like that, but you know, 80% of your time on a tuning with attachment dilemma, which is when your client catches that you see how stuck they are, and then into the pain or vulnerability from there. It's a huge mistake to try to get into vulnerability until you've really caught the dilemma. That's right. And George Fowler actually says, don't be reckless with vulnerability. Right. Because right? if you, you know, open them up and they're not ready, it, it will hurt them. Yeah. I mean, they, they, you know, dilemmas demand someone to see it. When you're stuck, if, your foot, if you're walking somewhere and your foot gets caught, in a draining thing, you don't need instructions for physical therapy. You need someone to come to you and see what you're stuck in. And so what you're calling an ax there, it's a nice metaphor, that is their dilemma. A, a great way to check in on someone's dilemma is when you see a block, be curious about what would happen if it wasn't there. Because for a pursuer, if they stop swinging the ax, what's gonna happen? Nothing's gonna happen. If I don't fight for this, nobody's going to. So the ax is actually showing you an aspect of their dilemma. Not that they're trying to be difficult. Right. It's not, it's not just that their which are is not there for them. They're showing you, I don't have good moves here. I've tried everything I know to do. As George says, for every time I'm critical, I bite my tongue 99 times. And so that one time I don't bite my tongue, then I get accused of being too much. And, and it makes everything worse. So again, we're coming along the pursuer and making space for you're fighting so hard for this relationship because life has taught you. If you stop fighting, the fight's going to be over. Right? right. And that, they don't have a lot of trust because they have tried 
every which way to the sundown. Often the pursuers will, I've read self-help books, I've listened to tapes, I've tried soft approach. It doesn't matter what I do, it just never reaches them. Right. And that is an incredibly huge dilemma. I don't right. know how to reach my partner. And it's true sometimes. It's true sometimes, no question. It's not like people are insane. It's like, wow, I really have tried these good things. I've read John Gottman's book and this, this person and this, and it's, I've done the positive startup. It's not working, right? Which just shows you it's not that simple. You can't enter a complex cycle with one strategy and, and change it. It doesn't work like that. And so, but coming back around and making sure we attune to the multiple dilemmas of that pursuer, right? Because if I stop swinging the ax, nothing's going to happen. And not only that, I am sort of sentencing myself into the dungeon to that worst possible experience that I'm unwanted, that nobody actually does want me. Right? So that's what we're asking of them when we ask them to put the axe down. That's a pretty big ask. Especially, right. especially if we don't give them the experience that we really see the complexities of what they're dealing with. Because right. they already, they're already get told too often that they're too much. Right. So what they're supposed to do is always saying, calm down, calm down, calm down, is doing the very thing to them that the cycle does to them. That's, that's the worst thing you can say to somebody. I know if I'm really angry, the last thing I want is told to calm down, right? Yeah, and I love, you know, the multiple dilemmas of the pursuer. You know, yeah, my ax isn't a good move, and a lot of them realize their ax isn't a good move. Yeah. But for them, doing nothing is also not a good move because oh. that means nobody's coming to them. Nothing will change, and it might reinforce this belief that maybe nobody does love me because no one's coming to me. And that is excruciating. So, of course, fighting seems like so much of a better strategy. Yeah, would you rather get, would you rather someone be mad at you for fighting too hard or just sit with abandonment? That's well, right. For most people, that's a pretty easy choice, so to speak. But not only that, there's other moves just to, just to expand our talk here. You know, um, pursuers withdraw and withdrawers pursue, but usually with different motives. You know, pers when pursuers withdraw, it's good. <laughs> bit of a silent treatment so to speak and it's like maybe someone will come chase me that's right and, and it maybe I, maybe I won't say anything critical for three months I'm gonna work hard three months no criticism but they're silent and their withdrawn partner reads them and so that doesn't really work either yeah so again what's yeah. most what's most important is for them to experience our getting that that's so true. I love how you say that because their withdrawing partner oftentimes will read them as, okay, they're not upset. They're not angry. So everything must be okay. So I'm not going to engage emotionally and check in and stir the pot and find out that something really is wrong, which feels like, can feel like the opposite. Again, see here, even not being critical, not being angry doesn't work. And I find it's almost like a test, like pursuers like to set up little tests okay, you're telling me if I do something different, then you'll be different for me. So I'm going to test you on that. I'm going to try it. And then it doesn't work because you need both partners to, to dance together. It doesn't help if one person is dancing and the other person is standing on the sidelines or vice versa, right? right? That's a great thing to reflect because testing is another move. That's another piece of their dilemma, right? And can, can you, the, then the task becomes for us as therapists recognizing what that test really is. Right. You're trying so hard to put a foot out on the pond to see if the ice is going to hold you up this time, right? And we're and you're working as hard as you can, and then but once you step in, the ice breaks again, right? So again, just making sure that they catch that we see their stuckness. They have three or four moves, and none of them seem to help. Right? Right. Sometimes as therapists, we become anxious about that. It's like, wow, this is feeling really, really hopeless. And that's, that's a dangerous thought, though, because that hopelessness feeling is empathy. That's bringing you into attunement. So if our anxiety pulls you out of that too quickly and it moves you towards some kind of solution or even moves you into vulnerability prematurely, right. we are out of attunement. We leave people in their dilemma. That's right. I love that's such a good, good thought that sometimes empathizing with the hopelessness, if we're not really kind of careful about our moves in this place can cause us to lose our footing and then we may go into whatever our cycle is you know because there's the client cycle and then our cycle with mm -hmm. them and our moves is if I'm feeling hopeless and gosh this is so stuck what do I do now and then 
we get anxious about a solution and then we might pop back into our head and you know try to give some kind of a tangible nugget or drop into deep vulnerability too quickly and it's not really a a good time an effective time to use that strategy yeah well it's premature yeah and we've not earned the right to see that and we've not created enough safety for it to maintain so you can try to go down there and have a different conversation but it's unlikely to last that's okay that's our stage one work but uh, I think if you can give them the sense that you see how stuck they are for very good reason, mm -hmm. that they in fact don't have super easy moves, mm -hmm. then you will, you will earn yourself a client who, who be more curious and more flexible. That's right. And what about um, these other clients that come in and they're super positive, right? Their, their mm -hmm. relationship is sunshine and rainbows yet they're still coming to therapy and no matter how much you try to get to what's the attachment dilemma here they'll say oh but i really trust that my partner loves me and that they're there for me they wouldn't cheat on me but they're still obviously they're in therapy right but it yeah. seems like no matter where we try to go they kind of block the entrance and nothing's wrong nothing's wrong nothing's wrong and then we're left well then why are you here if it's so perfect right those are tough man those are tough those can be really tricky you know, and you and I talked about this off air one time. I had a, a live that I was doing that I, probably my worst live I've ever done, honestly, because they, they had some funny things that had happened the week before and they were so positive. It was disorienting. And uh, cause I'm feeling the pressure knowing there's 65 people watching me in the next room and uh, everything is, is roses and rainbows. And so my mistake was I left, cause that is a dilemma, by the way, that is a dilemma. I left the dilemma too quickly and tried to reach for pain. You know, it's my question was, so what happens when it's not so good? Which was okay, and some things happen, but I really was not with them. So I think that there, it calls for the therapist to be patient and to really, really track at the same level of explicitness, the good feelings or de-escalation, partial de-escalation, as we do the negative pains. Look how it connects together to have them do some enactments that feel better and sometimes they will just naturally bring you back to where you know you really are. Other times, I think if you just do a good enough job tracking with this multiple times, you know, then you can just say, is it always this good? Or do you have complete confidence this will last? And, and can kind of show uh, where they are at that point. But those are tricky. And their dilemma, which we're going to keep a little more internal now, is to say, we've hurt for so long and now we've had one month where we haven't been cycle or fighting. So the dilemma is if we talk about something hard, we're going to lose our games. That, that makes sense. So, yeah, I'm thinking, you know, in this case, it's how do you find the dilemma, the attachment dilemma when the couple is not showing you pain, right? right. And it can be hard to miss a tune. It can be easy to miss a tune. I mean, when you're trying to go for the pain and they're like, no, we're, we're not really in pain, but, and I have found that some of these couples that they, some of them have, they're like Tony Robbins junkies and not that there's anything wrong with that, but you know, they tend to try to paint over gloss over anything negative in their life and stay in the positive and their window of tolerance for anything negative is really scary. And obviously they're coming to therapy, something's wrong, but yet they're presenting as, you know, everything's so positive, everything's good. And so I like how you say sort of tapping into that part that says, yeah, you guys have worked so hard to create this positive relationship and that's really important for you guys to hang on to. And maybe these moments when you guys dip out of connection become really hard and your guys' solution has always been to stay positive, to not really deal with that, just to right. sort of gloss over, sweep it under the rug. Everything's fine, it'll be fine. Yeah. I mean, avoidance is adaptive. It makes sense. It makes good sense. Um, I think it's important as for us as therapists, though, to realize having them have enactments that are with small positives is also really valuable. Because you can Either see way. how they interact with each other. If exactly. what they say, oh, yeah, we're, we're so good at this, and then you have them do it, you'll find out, is it really that good? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, even asking someone, so this is really incredible. And celebrate with them. Celebrate with them. This is really incredible that you guys are having such good times together. This is kind of the marriage that you always wanted, right? Yeah. Can you tell him that right now? 
I mean, if you can, that's a wonderful thing to hear. That's a wonderful gift you facilitated someone to hear. If they can't, we have a whole model built for that, right? Then they blocked it and they're right back into to what we do when their dilemmas and then into their pain. So either way, attuning with that and having them enact some of those things is really positive. Right. So, so let's just summarize here as we wrap up. So, you know, one of the things that I tell my supervisees too is, you know, make sure if anything, the first thing you achieve is that it makes sense for you and that you don't keep that it makes sense inside because it does no good if only you have made sense of it. You need to all make sense of it together. I can't That's, emphasize how important that is. That's such an yeah. important thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So if you're sitting here and you're trying to get their attachment dilemma or their pain and you aren't thinking this makes sense, we're already kind of lost. We're not really grounded. We're not really attuned to what's happening. We don't know how to make sense of what's in front of us. So I love how you say, boil it down to, um, you know, the attachment dilemma, the pain, just try to um, de, uh, what, what, I'm sorry, my mind is like kind of like, deconstruct, yeah, that the, the cycle doesn't have to be uber complex at first, you know, you want to deconstruct it into something that's more edible, and just work on having it make sense for you as the therapist and share that with them openly, work on the outside to all make sense of it together, and it's kind of like attuned, try to attune to their attachment dilemma. And in their attachment dilemma, you'll probably get their pain. There and you if, go. They're, if they're coming and showing their pain, attune to their pain and you'll get their attachment dilemma. Thank you for making my point much better than I did there. Very nice. <laughs> if, you, if you really, really click in, and it'll even feel that way, you'll hit that neurological resonance with those mirror neurons that we talk about at trainings. When you really click their dilemma, they'll have a big exhale. They'll say things like exactly. And then the pain is not only there, it's very organic. Like it's a really straight shot into the, to the most important pain that has the most resources for a corrective experience, which is what we're going for in the pain vulnerability. So recapping what you said, if I could really quickly, you know, I had 15,000 clinical hours before I ever started EMT. Okay, and so, so double that since a little more. And so our experience can work against you because honestly, I'm rarely surprised anymore. You do this long enough, it's like you just, you've heard all, everything in the world, but that can really work against you because good empathy can be the enemy of great attunement, like what we were talking about. So thinking that you got it and just kind of nodding your head like, yeah, 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 I heard that 100,000 times before, robs your clients of the opportunity to let them see the pain that you feel for their stuckness. That's what it means to really be with people. And uh, so I just want to repeat that. And like you said, I was thinking about a live I did really quickly about two years ago. It was on a military base. It was terrifying. <laughs> we were, the, the, the husband in that couple was in uniform. They were having really big pain. The room was crowded. And uh, if you were to come to me and said, hey, track their cycle, get all the moves, do this, put it all together, show them the cycle, and have these great enactments, I would have had a panic attack. I mean, I, I, don't, I, I couldn't do it. And I'm a trainer in theory. Uh, but if you came to me and said, hey, man, just go in and make their attachment dilemmas really clear. Like, see how they're stuck. And then go over here and see how this person's stuck. You just show them, be with them in their stuckness. I'm like, I can do that with anybody, any place, any time. So that, that sense that I have to move them prematurely, that anxiety that we feel can kind of block that. And, and, and at a meta level here, what we're talking about, Annabelle, is working with our clients' blocks. And sometimes as EFTers, we don't spend enough time on that because we just want to get to the good stuff. But it's important to remember that that, that is attachment, that is love, to be with people in their pain before we deserve the right and create enough safety to go for the corrective experiences in the pain. Yeah, that's so amazing, Ryan. Thank you so, so much. And yeah. now you, you offer this, this is something that you kind of specialize in. Now, do you do supervision around this? Do you do trainings around it? I do. I do. I have a heart to help people. First of all, I have a real passion to help people make sense of the EFT process and grow. I love to, when I do supervision, I'll have people uh, 
send me their hardest, their hardest case. And I'll give them feedback on that. I really enjoy that. You know, those, those really chaotic couples that are super hard. Yeah, so I do a good bit of that. And so if folks want to find you and they want to come to a training or, you know, they, maybe they want to seek supervision from you, you know, tell us about the trainings that you offer, where people can sign up or find them. Yeah, so ArkansasEFT.com is our website. They'll have all our trainings locally here um, on that. And uh, then I travel around with other trainers and some partnering kind of work. Um, and you can email me directly. My email address is ryanreinaphd at gmail.com. Awesome. Uh, so that's fun. And uh, so we have so a big... you are Dr. Ryan Rana then. In theory, I am, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Well, I'm so sorry I missed that earlier. Dr. Yeah. Ryan Rana, awesome. Yeah, I, just, I just go by Ryan, no problem. <laughs> but, uh, but we have externships coming up uh, two this, this year for me, one in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and then we're launching a, a new EFT community in Monroe, Louisiana. Wow. in November. So we're really excited about that. Yeah. Wow. That's really awesome. Okay. So ArkansasEFT.com mm -hmm. and I will put a link to your website and your email in the description for the video. Is there any other websites or ways that folks can find you if they want to find you or attend your trainings? Nope. That's the main ways. That's the main Perfect. way. I, uh, you know, I'm on the, um, among the EFT trainers, I'm on the Create for Connection team. So we travel and do some of those to uh, Christian faith-based groups who want to explore attachment and EFT from a faith or spirituality lens. So I really enjoy that and consider that a great opportunity. Excellent. Excellent. I, also, I also love to work with military, police, law enforcement kind of folks. And I've been doing uh, some business leadership uh, applications with the EFT in the past three years. So enjoy all those opportunities. That's great. That's great. Thank you again so much. Dr. Ryan Rana, <laughs> AKA Ryan. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us today and you know, just for sharing your wisdom. And I really look forward to having you back on our show again. Guys, if you love what you heard today, you know, Ryan is really talented, he's really knowledgeable. Please don't hesitate to reach out to him to ask for supervision. You can even have him come to your area and do a training or you can find his trainings on his website. If you want to travel, you know, tax write offable, <laughs> tax deductible vacations, and uh, go attend a training in his area. So, thank you again, Ryan, so much for being here. And we just want to say thank you to our viewers. Make sure that you guys hit subscribe because more episodes are on the way. Mm -hmm.